No worries. All righty, good morning, everyone. We have um, started our um, July, July, not June, July 12th <laughs> meeting. Uh, so we're gonna ahead, go ahead and call this to order. Um, first uh, point of business on our agenda is uh, any public comment. Um, Melinda, do you see anyone who, or can you um, ask for public comment? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, okay, if there's anyone here for public comment, if you can please raise your virtual hand to indicate you'd like to speak. All right, looks like we do have a few people. Um, just a reminder, uh, you will have three minutes and then at the end of three minutes, we'll ask you to make your closing statement. So it looks like our first speaker will be Kent Badgley. Let me go ahead and unmute you. All right, Kent, you should be able to unmute yourself on your end. There we uh, go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Kent. All right, you have three minutes and you have the floor. Well, as a former RTD director from 2009 to 2016, I've been very interested to watch uh, what you have prepared. And uh, I uh, congratulate you on the effort that you've made over the last uh, six, seven months or more. And my really my only comment is in reference to your final report. And there are 14 uh, pages of 82 pages that were related to uh, the Northwest Rail. And I find it very disappointing that you've scrubbed uh, some of the major recommendations from the basic report that relate to uh, the Northwest Rail. I know it's included in the appendice, but it will, the report will be read, the appendice will fall apart and be somewhat meaningless. So uh, I suggest that you put more meat into the, uh, uh, the report, the base report, uh, and rather than just in the appendice. That's my comment, and I uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Thank you. Melinda, I see that there's a, another hand raised. Yes, there is. Um, okay, so our next speaker will be Joan Lyons. So Joan, let me go ahead and unmute you now and you'll just need to unmute on your end. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, you have three minutes and you have the floor. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, hello everyone, my name is Joan Lyons. I'm the Planning and TDM Projects Manager for Boulder Chamber and Boulder Transportation Connections. We had previously submitted a letter to the RTD Accountability Committee in response to the draft recommendations from the committee. And we just want to make sure that the accountability plan is developed to show us how the committee's recommendations will be implemented at RTD and accounted for and measured. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any other virtual hands raised for public comments. So we will close that portion of our agenda. Um, next agenda item is the June 28th uh, RTD Accountability Committee meeting summary. Are there any uh, changes that anyone would like to make? Okay, none. Yeah, I don't see any in the chat or on the screen. So it looks like we're good to go there. Uh, Co-chair report. I don't have any comments. Elise, do you have anything to report? Happily, I don't. All righty. Um, and I think this is where I will hand it off to you. Okay, I believe next up we have our regular report from RTD and I see that we have General Manager Johnson on. So I'm guessing you are ready to do that. 
Good morning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Just a couple of notable highlights that I'd like to share with all of you this morning. Um, RTD has been working um, in earnest as we start with our outreach portion of our fair study and equity analysis. We held a meeting a couple of weeks back on Thursday night, a week ago Thursday night, and basically had wonderful participation in the midst of a telephone town hall where we got a lot of great uh, suggestions as we look to leverage uh, an external consultant sometime the latter part of this summer um, as we embark upon that effort so we can level set our affairs and make informed decisions to create access for all of our customer segments. Secondly, we've also been in the midst of doing um, outreach as relates to our uh, proposed September service changes. Coupled with that was a uh, service equity analysis in relationship to ensuring that there was not a disparate impact or disproportionate burdens on uh, minority communities or those of low income. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, the Civil Rights Committee will be hearing the service equity analysis and for their consideration, look to uh, take action on that if they feel that's appropriate. Uh, dovetailing with that also is the proposed service changes which spawn from that service equity analysis. Moreover, I've been working diligently, I have been working diligently with the board of directors as we create alignment around our strategic plan, ensuring that we have developed outcomes that generate our North Star relative to any activities and key performance indicators so we can ensure that this organization becomes one of high performance. Um, so that's a broad brush uh, uh, synopsis. Moreover, we've been uh, providing service, recognizing that there's a major event in town being the um, Major League Baseball All-Star Game and have been coordinating with uh, the city and county of Denver and ensuring that there's viable access um, in and around uh, key activity centers here in the greater part of the service area. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, provide a brief update on RTD activities. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I actually have one. Um, as I think we're all aware, this is our last official meeting of this committee. And then we hand over, hopefully, um, we will ad adopt our recommendations today and then hand them over to you for your review. And I'm curious what process you have in place to review them in order to respond by the, the deadline that, that has been assigned of 45 days. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, recognizing that um, I, as well as my respective team and our board members who are assembled here as ex officio members have been coordinating with all of you. So we've been tracking that and have already had internal discussions and started uh, responses to said comments, recognizing the last meeting that was convened on June 28th, there's multitude of discussions and so forth. So we're waiting to see what that is. But as we look to get input from the board, I as staff am taking the lead in preparing comments, um, uh, comments, I'm sorry, preparing um, responses. And in turn, we'll share that with the board. Um, ideally, we had a timeline outlined, but recognizing the schedule has shifted one month somewhat, optimally what we endeavor to do is to provide comments to the board in advance, then have a study session whereby they can talk about their comments and assemble said comments as appropriate, looking for their input on areas uh, of which they have the auspices in which to do, because we see it as a combined effort relative to the operational aspect of RTD, which I oversee from a management aspect, and then policy and governance type issues. So we will be solidifying that timeline once we have an understanding when we will receive said comments from the accountability committee. Thank you for that. Other questions of CEO Johnson? Being none, thank you very much. And we will um, turn to the, um, the big item of the day, which is our the final review of our recommendations. And um, I'm looking at the Dr. Cog staff to see if they're gonna sort of kick off the um, sort of review. I don't know if we'll put that up on the screen to go over the final changes, but I see Matthew just turned on his camera. So I'll hear from you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, committee. Um, so as you remember, uh, the, at the June 14th meeting, we had a public hearing 
and uh, the, the committee discussed the draft recommendations, equity assessments, and uh, the public feedback. And then uh, at the last meeting on June 28th, the committee members were um, uh, discussed the, um, the draft recommendations again, as well as the, uh, the final draft final report and uh, members uh, after that meeting were provided a virtual platform to make suggested edits. And Dr. Cog and Hi uh, North Highland staff reviewed the suggestions and prepared an updated document, uh, which is attached uh, to the agenda uh, for the committee to consider today. And in addition, uh, there's also a companion, a companion document that compiles a substantial outstanding uh, uh, discussion items uh, from comments received on the draft final report so the committee can take each one up individually discuss it and decide whether to amend it into the adoption draft or uh, uh, prior to final action and I, I turn it back over uh, to uh, to the chair uh, to uh, to take us through this and and certainly happy to uh, to to help as needed What's the committee's pleasure on how to uh, move through the final document? Do we want to scroll through the final document with the red line changes on the screen and just see if there's agreement on them? And maybe um, if staff could highlight any outstanding discussion items as we go through that so we don't miss anything. Does that work? That's fine. Works for me. Yeah, that works. All right, so why don't you put share your screen, Matthew, and we'll just start scrolling through. And and I I think the way we'll do it is um, if people don't if people are okay with it, great. Um, but you need to speak up if there's any edits that were made um, or not made that you want to flag for discussion. So the the final. So are we going through? Just to be sure, we're going through the final adoption draft because uh, the the outstanding uh, items for the committee to discuss is a separate document. So for for visual purposes, uh, what what is the what is the preference? Um. Well, let's see. Um, would it be? We could, I was thinking we would go through the redlined um, final report, but um, would it be helpful to do a do a brief overview of the outstanding discussion topics first, or just capture them as we go through the document? Uh, hey, Lisa. Oh, go. I was going to say let's do the outstanding items first, and then okay. make sure they're. Okay. I think that would be a cleaner way. All right. So but let's. That's my do suggestion. That. Okay, so the number one, the we'll just scroll through the items and maybe try to reach resolution as we go through. Um, so the first one is, what's the appropriate timeline do we feel for RTD's implementation? Madam Chair, if I may, uh, yep. I recall the, the conversation being more about um, uh, requesting RTD uh, include a time, a, an estimated timeline for um, implementation of the recommendations as part of this discussion. And it could be a combo. I, one of the, um, it's difficult for me to see people raise their hands. So, um, if folks can chime in from the committee on this particular topic. I think I wrote this draft language as a placeholder. Um, I think that suggestion had come to us from the MCC that we suggest a timeline for RTD, but um, as Matthew pointed out, it could be that uh, we call on RTD to suggest a timeline. W one option would be for us to say, we roughly think a year is, is good um, but we're happy to hear from RTD on um, their recommendation for timeline implementation that differs from that. What do others think? I think that sounds great to me. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this is this is Rudd. I think I have my hand raised. 
I, I just want to say that I don't think on all of these we really would be prepared to to say, and this is how long it will take you. But I think when that when that 45 day response comes back from RTD, they should say this is how long. They should either say we we won't do this, and here's why, or they should say this is how long it might take. At that point, I think there'd be a discussion among our committee members as to whether that we felt that was an appropriate timeline. Does that seem like a reasonable approach? I think, it, sure, Rut, although I don't think our charge necessarily has us engaged in an ongoing dialogue with RTD on this. So um, after we hear back from the RTD, on their responses to our recommendations. This may be something that then gets kicked back to the governor and the legislature to see if they think RTD's um, response is adequate. We could weigh in, but we don't really have much authority. So, right. uh, which is why I was suggesting in general, a year, happy to hear um, for specific recommendations from RTD on what would be appropriate if a year is is not adequate. I don't, I don't think we have any authority, but I do think we have the ability to comment on what we feel about the timelines that are that we hear back from RTD. And then it goes to the governor and the legislature and others. You're right, we do not have the authority to impose any specific right. timelines. I, I just meant more, um, I don't know what people's expectations are for how long this committee will stay in formation and um, engage, but um, I, I think we're not, um, we don't necessarily know, we don't have plans for necessarily existing after our final meeting with RTD to hear their response, right. but I'm, I'm open to that. What yeah, other I, folks think? I just wanna echo what I'm hearing from both of you, because I don't, I just, I agree with both of you. Um, I understand, I, I don't know if I have a, great barometer of how long things would take. So it feels a little, you know, I would like to get RTD's uh, input and kind of go from there. However, this is the, the last official meeting, you know, of, of our convened group. Um, so, you know, being able to offer a suggestion or some sort of uh, opinion, I think makes sense as well. So I'm okay with 12 months unless um, somebody on the call wants to offer a different timeline. I don't know if I, I don't believe I have a strong inclination of what a better timeline would be, but for the purposes of wanting to just offer something to, you know, put something on paper, start, you know, trying to pinpoint some timelines, I'm, I would be okay with that. So for, what about saying in the language we're all looking at, the last sentence of that paragraph, it says further the committee, how about if we insert the word generally believes that 12 months is an appropriate timeline, dot, dot, dot. Um, but we, then we could add a final sentence of saying, however, or um, we'd request that RTD provide a specific timeline for implementation when it, in its 45-day uh, response or something like that, which sort of splits so the difference. The default would be a year, but but we'll, we'll ask RTD to provide specifics for specific recommendations and add their expertise on, on the implementation piece. I guess I think it reads fine the way it is, at least. I mean, the committee requests RTD present its response at an in-person meeting um, for the committee believes that maybe just there, including timeline, including implementation timeline, maybe you just put that in there. In that okay. sentence, because there's an insert that meeting. where the committee requests that RTD present its its re, its response and timeline implementation timeline at an in person meeting with committee members. Further, the committee believes twelve months is an appropriate timeline for RTD to implement its recommendation. But then we give them the out, recognizing that some improvements may take longer to complete than others. I like we, that. Yeah, Brett, what do you think? I, I think there are definitely some of these that are going to be a lot longer than a year in order to implement. 
but the, the point, the most important point is how long before they begin implementing these, these things and then how long they anticipate it will take for them to implement it. Rut, do you okay. think that's covered with the insertion of an implementation timeline? Yes, because, okay. because that includes here's when we'll begin and here's when we think we'll be finished. So I like that. Okay, yeah. and then I have another, and I'm not sure if it's covered here or not, so I just wanted to get a feel from the rest of you. There were some things that we acknowledged that might be worth taking a look at two years from now. How are those being handled in this? statement. Um, so is it that a recommendation? Is that coming through as a recommendation and it'll be addressed? Do you think that's going to be covered in the statements here? So for example, taking a, taking a look at the structure of the organization of the, of the board itself? Into I, I, I think that was, that was inherent in the uh, okay. recommendation itself, where okay. we said that, you know, it may take two years before you're really in a position to do that. And so, so I think their response would be, we will monitor it over the next two years. In, in two years, we'll have a plan in two years to take uh, a closer look and, and respond to this. That, that, that seems like. Okay, that was I just what want to make I was sure thinking that, as well. Okay, I thought it as well, but wanted to make sure that wasn't just wishful thinking on my part, or that was really kind of understood from the committee. So good, sounds like we're all on the same page there. Thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, um, the proposal is to add the words and implementation timeline after response in the um, third sentence there. Are there any problems from any committee members with that? And staff help me out because I cannot see, see raise hands. Raise thumbs, can you see those? I can see yours. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Let's move on to number two. Can you scroll up, Matthew? And number two is spend federal relief funding recommendations. Should the committee include language addressing transparency in RTD's use of surplus funds? And uh, before we get into committee discussion, just um, just a question or, or comment question: um, uh, Should uh, should we be amending this document or or taking the amendment? Uh, the, the amending language and inserting it into the final report for clarification. You, you should be uh, putting it in the final report. Right. But it's just too, we can't, if you could do that off screen, because I don't think yeah. we can share both documents. No, I, I just meant uh, just for clarification purposes, we're not, we're not sharing this document separate. It's we're amending the language in this document and then um, incorporating it into the final report. Correct. After this meeting, the document we're looking at on outstanding issues will cease to exist. We're just editing the final report. Right. So on number two is, is the issue to whether or not to, to insert this back into the final document. Madam Co-Chair, this is Ron. Yep. If you don't mind. I, I think um, procedurally, I, th I think this is fine going through these outstanding issues. And just for a little bit of further background, these are these are things, these are comments that we received from committee members in the review of the final draft report that we felt were more than just sort of language clarification issues that we felt like these were a little bit more substantive issues. So I, I, what we what we would anticipate is get through this conversation. If there's general agreement among the committee about how to resolve these issues, then once it comes time to approving the final report, um, we, would, we would suggest that you ask for a motion on the, on the action draft, on approving the action draft, and then circle back to each of these and do an amendment to amend the, the final language into the final report before a final vote on the final report. Just some logistical background. Um, okay. We will uh, endeavor to do so, but I'm gonna try to pick up the pace then I'm moving through the outstanding issues list. On number two, 
is the proposal to add this, the language we see on the screen? Yes. And this was listed for, lifted from our initial rec, uh, letter, was it not? Could staff tell us where this language and Madam recommendation Chair, came from? Madam Chair, mm -hmm. may I? Uh, the use of stimulus funds is uh, pretty straightforward. It's to reduce, I mean, it's to reimburse RDD for operating expenses. By virtue of uh, receiving all of these stimulus funds though, RTD generates surplus. And I think, rather than a lot of scrutiny on how it's using the uh, stimulus funds, uh, the focus should be on how it's using the surplus that's generated that's going into fund balance. Okay, I guess I, I'd be kind of happy well, to least, hear about both. Did you see this language is, uh, Tanya just in the chat said, this language is what's in the document right now. Just so everyone's clear on that. Yeah, uh, Madam Co-Chair, this is Ron again, sorry. Um, as Tanya noted, this language is existing language in the report. We received some comment from an, an accountability committee member that indicated maybe some discomfort with this language and an interest in um, whether this language should be included in the final report or not. And we don't know who the accountability committee member was that made that comment. So if um, someone wants to kind of uh, speak to speak I to confess, that, that would be helpful. I confess it was me. Um, and again, there are you know stringent guidelines in terms of how the stimulus funds can be used primarily to re reimburse transit agencies for the operating expenses. However, since these funds are kind of a windfall, they create surplus at year end. Uh, I was saying that you might not be able to use the stimulus funds to support some other uh, nonprofit organization uh, to help them uh, weather COVID, but you could use the surplus funds that are generated. And so I hear there's a lot of concern about how the stimulus funds are being used but those guidelines are fixed by the federal government. Uh, more concern ought to be focused on how the surplus funds are being used that are going to fund balance. So Madam Chair. Yep. I, it seems to me that as, as Dan's pointed out, and we've heard this from Deborah also, there are real strict guidelines in how a lot of the surplus funds are to be used. I'm not sure if this most recent round is as, as strictly controlled, but at any rate, if you're using those funds to pay salaries and things like that, then there may be, uh, there may be profit is the wrong word, but some surplus funds where you're not having to spend uh, as much money in all these other areas. And as a result of that, uh, you may have funds that you can that you can use in other ways. And, and I think that's the part, it seems to me, Dan, that's the part that you're, that you're getting at is that we shouldn't directly name the, uh, the funds that come out of the federal government. We should, we should somehow refer to those funds that may be generated as a result of the federal government's funds covering some of the costs of operating RDD. That's well, I, correct. I guess, but, but this is a, a, the language we're looking about is, it, looking at is about transparency. And even if there are strict guidelines, that doesn't negate the fact that the public is going to want to see how the funds were used. It's a part of, of, of accountability with, with public dollars. And it's exactly what we did with the CARES Act review. Right, CARES Act money had pretty strong sidebars. We reviewed it and said, RTD spent the money based on the sidebars. Everybody should feel good about it. And here's how it was spent, right? right. So you wanna do that regardless of the flavor of the money 
for the committee's purpose and using funds to, to implement our recommendations, we care about that even more. But I think we want transparency throughout all reporting on all buckets of federal funding. And RTD should want that as well because you know that's just, it's good public process. So I guess I'm, I hear what you're saying, Dan, about the important. If I might, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be transparency about how the funds are used, but how they're used is really dictated by the federal government and it's for operating expenditures. There are recommendations about uh, using some of these stimulus funds to support nonprofit organizations that were hard hit by the pandemic. I'm not sure RTD will be able to use those stimulus funds in those ways, but it can use the surplus that's been generated in those ways. Last year, there was $80 million added to surplus. So I think what this is saying is that if there is a surplus generated, and I would imagine with $700 million coming in, there's going to be quite a bit of surplus, that it's the use of those funds also that should require some transparency. If, if I could just jump in really quick, just for my own, I, I may be getting confused because it seems like we're, we're talking about both number two and number three at the same time, because number three recommendation is where I see some of your concerns lifted up, Dan, around nonprofit and community-based transportation service providers. And so I, I, just for my own clarification, are we focusing on number two or are we addressing these two, two and three at the same time? They kind of go uh, hand in hand, really. One is just talking about addressing transparency and use of surplus. Number three is talking about using CRISA funds to cover expenses of other transit providers. Um, that would not apply to surplus year end funds. So I think this has been modified based on comments I made, which uh, was intended to say that I'm not sure you can use the CRISA funds directly to support these other agencies, but you could use surplus funds. Would it make sense to you to just insert a <clears throat> excuse me insert a sentence saying because of federal CRISA dollars there will there will be surplus year end revenues and we would and the committee requests an accounting be presented of how those dollars are spent or something like that I mean there may just, be additional surplus revenue right perfect even better right so but but is that what what could solve this problem? Uh, at the end, because there may be year-end surplus dollars as a result of, the, keep the, all the language that's there, I think we all want that transparency, but inserting a, a sentence at the end that says, because, what does everybody think of that? That's, that's fine with me. I was just flagging the issue yes. in the, uh, you know, in the comments, in the, uh, 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 the review that we did of the, final report. I, I was think not that's... necessarily expecting them to make it into the document, but I think they're valid. Did staff capture that sentence? We are uh, recording this, Madam Chair, and we are going to go back through it. Plus, um, we, uh, I, uh, we can um, uh, have you, uh, the, the committee, uh, you know, finalize everything and, and, and vote on it. So there wasn't really a great sentence there. There was a great introduction to a sentence. <laughs> so, but I think staff understands the intent. So perhaps some, somebody could, as, as, as the committee continues to work on this, somebody else could um, uh, uh, add, just add this language. And I see another comment coming in. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't, it said about, I think we want to keep the language that's there and add the other sentence saying because of these dollars, there may there may be, to Rutt's point, year-end funds. Ron, is that something that you could, and we would like to see an accountability of those, and he's there. Madam Co-Chair, um, Mayor Malaya, I, I think Rebecca's chat message is probably um, important and, and sort of reflects the comment I was going to make to the to the committee. And, and I, Dan, I mean, Dan's right, right? There are restrictions on the use of the federal COVID relief funds to some extent. However, RTD has 
choices about what operating expenses it has as it re as it restores services and to the and so when they make those choices about those operating expenses they can seek reimbursement from those covid relief funds um, within the restrictions that congress has placed on those funds and i think the original language here was about um, RTD being transparent about the decisions um, that when they restore when they're deciding to restore service and then seeking reimbursement using COVID relief funds to to cover those costs. Um, RTD because demand was low for that that first round of COVID relief funds um, chose not to restore as much service as money they were receiving in CARES Act money and were able to put something like eighty million dollars back into the reserve funds. Um, they could have increased their operating expenses an additional $80 million and reimbursed themselves and use those CARES Act money to, to cover those, those operating costs. So those are decisions that RT has available to them. And I think this language was about um, asking RTD to be transparent in those decisions. Rebecca, did I capture that correctly? Beautifully, Ron. Thank you. So I just want to understand what line changes people are suggesting to the final draft. Um, because I think we're uh, in agreement on the content. And the question is, what of that is not adequately captured in our final recommendations? Jackie had suggested a sentence basically saying there may be a year on surplus as a result of these funds and there should be account of, uh, transparency and accountability regarding how those funds are spent. If I understood, Jackie, your suggestion, if we add that sentence, are we good to go? Yeah, I'm seeing head nods, so. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. Okay, so staff capture that. We want a sentence um, per that. So that gets us through number two. Um, does uh, Dan, help us out. Is there another point being made in number three that isn't captured by that? <clears throat> I don't consider myself an expert, but in looking at some of the guidelines, I'm not sure RTD has the capability to provide funding for these nonprofit organizations that may have been hard hit during the pandemic <clears throat> using CRISA funds but they may be able to use some of the surplus that's been generated by virtue of the receipt of those funds uh, to provide some support. That may be true, but I think our recommendations um, refer to all of the federal funds that have been received and, and recognize that some come with more strings than others. So I don't know if that's, um, they're still able to provide uh, dollars to other transit service providers for, with some of the funds per, and that's one of our recommendations. Madam Chair, we could, we yep. could use the, the sentence that was already uh, put together about using the surp, uh, having the transparency on how RTD spends those surplus funds and then further just add that um, the committee recommends that the, um, the surplus funds be used for that number three there. Well, I would say the committee recommends RTD consider using, I mean, we don't know what trade-offs yeah, sure. they're gonna be making. And then my only other comment would be if you just take out the CRISA from that last part of the sentence. So you just say, they would benefit greatly from RTD funding if the committee is comfortable with that language. And I'm just trying to solve the problem with, you know, kind of getting the sentiment in there. You, um, you could even drop a where appropriate on the end yeah. of that sentence to and give uh, RTD some wiggle room if there are specific federal constraints on how that money is to be spent. One little where yeah. appropriate goes a long way sometimes. Yeah. And, and so maybe take out CRISA and just say federal funding and then add a comma where appropriate. Yeah. Does that get us there? Crystals, did you, are you seeing Crystal's chat, Elise? 
I know you're managing a bunch of um, screens, so. Well, the last one was sounds good to me, so. Okay, good, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, got, you, Jackie. You got that, I was done the one before that one, so there you go. <laughs> oh. Just mostly agreeing with the, the conversation. I agree, all the points doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't mean we can't offer what we think um, ought to be spent. And if that's not the case, RTD, I think is fully capable of saying why they will or will not use a specific pot of funding. And um, if they're going to move forward with the idea, what alternative uh, source of funding they'll use there. Okay, so Crystal, are you suggesting something different than the, the, the Oh, that last sounds good to me was you all wrapping up that conversation and me agreeing with that. So no, I'm okay. not offering anything different. All right. So as I understand it for number three, we are removing the word Krista from the last sentence, replacing it with federal and adding at the end where appropriate. Madam Chair, may I make a recommendation? Um, sure. Instead of replacing Krista with federal, just having no uh, word in front of funding, because if it's surplus funds, it could technically be uh, local dollars. Okay, I appreciate that. So just remove Krista and add where appropriate. Okay, everybody good with that? We'll move to four. Number four, uh, improve operator retention recommendation. Uh, should the committee recommend RTD reopen contract negotiations for collective bargaining agreements to address compensation, which may be connected to operator uh, recruitment and retention. And I will say that this is new suggested language. Uh, the, the, um, the language that was recommended by the subcommittee was uh, just the um, uh, endorsing, endorsing the, the state audit, uh, which did not include this specific language. Madam Chair? Yes? I have a confession to make. This was a comment that I made. And I have a copy of RTD's collective bargaining, bargaining agreement. It does terminate at the end of 2021. So they may already be you know, gearing up for negotiations with, uh, with the union about wages and so forth. We found it beneficial to uh, terminate our our agreement that was going to end at the end of the year and have a renegotiation, uh, putting it in effect in July of this year because inflation has been uh, so great here in the last year, especially around housing and so forth. We really needed to adjust wages in order to not only be able to recruit people, but to retain them. Uh, that certainly is an RTD uh, decision to make and it's not an easy one, it's complicated, but I just threw that out there, you know, the, the committee can determine whether or not that's a recommendation. Thoughts Dan, from the committee members. So, sorry, Elise, I didn't mean to, but so Dan, given the fact that the collective bargaining agreement does expire this year and they will be opening it up to do it anyway, I, do, I, I'm kind of questioning whether or not this is necessary. Um, because I assume RTD as part of their, and I know the union I'm, as part of their negotiation process is going to be making recommendations on salary. So I, I guess it's happening anyway. Do we need to be adding this? I question the value. Yeah, I, and if I remember correctly, when, when the committee was discussing the operator retention and my, my memory could, be completely off, but I seem to remember they were already in the process of negotiating um, with the union back in, in early March or so, or at least starting those conversations. So I, I just kind of wonder if this is, um, if it's already in process, will this show up within the, the, the earlier recommendation when we ask RTD for a report out? Like I'm trying to figure out what's the value, I guess. Other thoughts or a response from Dan on that? Madam, Rudd, has his, Rudd has his hand up. Okay. Madam Rudd. Chair, if I if I recall our discussions in 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 uh, Dea's committee and in other places, uh, in listening to what the auditors had to say, one one of the big issues wasn't just salary; it was the routes that were given 
and how different routes were assigned. And, and I think seniority played a very big part in that, at least for the people that were represented, for the operators that were represented. So newer people coming in tended to get the worst routes or the routes that were most difficult in one way or the other. I, I just wonder if that issue has been raised at all in the negotiations with labor on this one. And maybe Deborah could comment on that. Because that was, as I understood it, a big reason also why we were losing, losing people according to the audit. So thank you very much. While I appreciate the question, I would be operating in bad faith if I would ensue with a discussion here on this platform because that would be in violation of collective bargaining agreements and unfair labor practice. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not able to address that question in this public forum. We have agreed upon ground rules as we go forward and all those things and I would be putting the agency in a precarious position. We wouldn't want that. So, um, any other thoughts? I'm hearing several say this this issue is already being addressed. I'm hearing Rutt say that it, that compensation it's not just compensation. Um, it's also route assignments. All of which are being negotiated, right? That's all being negotiated in the union contract. Unless, unless RTD, you know, it, uh, CEO Johnson can correct that. Uh, but it's my understanding all of that will be addressed already in the union negotiations. I don't think it needs to be part of ours. So I guess I'll. I don't, make I don't think we can ask that question of, of CEO Johnson, but at least in this discussion, though it is, it is not uh, essentially necessarily going to be a part of. Uh, what we have in our recommendations, the issue will have been raised and, and uh, pointed out that it was a, that it was a concern and, and uh, in terms of retention may be an important consideration in the so opinion of some of the members of this committee, but not officially. Rhett, are you suggesting a change to I'm our I'm suggesting we don't make a change and put any language in uh, with regard to that, with the knowledge that those negotiations are underway and it is not in our best interest to interfere with those. Okay. So Dan, do you want to keep pushing for us to add language? I'm hearing several people say they think um, it's being addressed in, in the negotiations that are underway and therefore not necessary for us to add language, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond if you feel strongly otherwise. Sure. Madam Chair, I, I withdraw the, the language. Uh, I probably should have looked at the collective bargaining agreement to see when it expired before I put my comments in my review of the final report. So sorry to take us down this rabbit trail. Um, oh, that's all right. Um, it's it's, we'll, it's we'll good leave to this be... in the capable hands of CEO Johnson. Okay. Well, and I think it's good that you you flag issues so we can air them, but it, it sounds like we can move on uh, to number five and that we won't be adding language on number four. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. So number five, performance measure recommendation. Does the measure percent increase in fair revenue conflict with the re committee's recommendation to reduce or eliminate fares and or the recently enacted led legislative recommendation to remove the fair box percentage requirement. And uh, th this would be, uh, this is a question of existing language in the report, whether to change it. Could, and, go ahead, could I make one quick suggestion there? I think part of the problem was it, it talks about percent increase in fair revenue. And I think just to leave it open to all possibilities, including reduction of fares, we should say percent increase or decrease in fair revenue, both in uh, number five and in number two, uh, the third, the second bullet or second sub bullet in that. Because I think RTD needs the flexibility to decide in some cases where they are reducing revenues as well as increasing revenues. 
So, so just to put this in context, and I added this to the um, document as a as a query because it was brought up. I think it was in Boulder County's comments, and and I too wondered because of the legislation that passed. These are performance metrics that presumably help illustrate whether RTD is moving towards a goal. It's a little bit. I find the bullet. It's the the second open bullet under two problematic because what's the target? Um, there's, you know, on the revenue side, more money from fares is good. And that's what this sort of historically has been about. Our, a lot of our recommendations are around reducing fares. CEO Johnson has recognized that fares are too high now. So reducing fares would, would get you closer towards a goal um, throughout our recommendations. And so I find a metric going in either direction is a difficult one to track because how do you measure whether or not you're being successful because you're trying to go in two different directions at the same time, depending on your interpretation of this. So as a performance metric, I find it problematic because it's hard to assign success to it. Right? I, I would argue that uh that there are financial performance metrics and there are also social performance metrics or effectiveness of transit metrics. And the financial ones say, we've got to keep getting more and more money for tickets or whatever, but this, the social ones and the ones that have to do with how effectively transit is serving the greater community may argue for a lowering of this number. And, and a lowering of fares in the process, which I, I know that's one thing uh, CEO Johnson has discussed before. And so I think it's a good metric to have and it's, it's a good thing to measure, but I think there needs to be a recognition that it may not just be about increasing it, it may also be about decreasing it. Which I think is exactly what I just said. So oh, good. I, I just wanna, so maybe it's percent change in fair revenue and we keep it in there, recognizing that we have two different de definitions of success, which will make it difficult for the public to, to look at some dashboard and say, are we moving towards our, our target or not? We have two opposing targets for this metric. And I just want to point right. out the inherent conflict in both the public's understanding of what's trying to be achieved and deciding internally and externally whether RTD is meeting its goal. So mm -hmm. uh, at a minimum, let's, I would say we should change it to percent change in fair revenue. It's worth measuring, but whether yeah. or not it's good or bad is open to interpretation depending on which, whether you're trying to reach a financial goal or a social goal. I think that'd be a great compromise in this. A great clarification too. Okay, does anybody oppose replacing percent increase in fair revenue with percent change in fair revenue? I'm not seeing. So we'll, we'll then make that change. Move on to the next one. Number six, fares and passes recommendation. Should the committee recommend RTD explore increasing the age of youth receiving passes to include middle schoolers or possibly even high schoolers? This could make up for the impact of reducing the fare discount from 60% to 50%. And um, this would be this this would be also a, a change uh, to the original draft recommendation. So just to provide some context, because I added this one based on recommendations in the comments we received, pointing out that if we standardize the discount rate, which helps with simplification, you actually decrease the benefit in the youth category, as I understand it, which is currently 60%. You could make up for that loss and benefit by in, you know, increasing the age of free transit for youth or, or some other way so that you could keep the discount at 50% across all categories for simplification without um, having a, dis, uh, uh, a, a uh, disproportionate impact on 
the existing youth benefit. Does that make sense to people? So I'm throwing yeah. it out there on whether or not we want to um, add that, not as a hard recommendation, but as an exploration by um, RTD. It's sort of in keeping with the idea of having, you know, trying to do a family pass. If you can get most of your kids or all of your kids on the bus for free, ten, I assume that's what we're trying to achieve with the family pass idea. This would be a simpler way of getting there. If I just have a, a point of clarification, I, I thought the youth fair was already from six to 19. So are we proposing that RTD explore increasing the age beyond 19 year olds to potentially take advantage of the youth fair? Um, the, well, that would be an important clarification, either that or increasing the, um, the age of youth that don't even need passes that just ride for free would be that less administratively burdensome way to do that. And that way you can take your family to a, to a game and you know, not have to get individual tickets for the kids. For example, yeah. I feel like that was the intent of what we were trying to get. We we named it a family plan, knowing that it may not necessarily be an immediate family, but rather how do how do people just buy basically multiple tickets for folks that they are traveling with, youth or kids. Some, something like that also on the weekends when there's really low ridership. A study that I asked RTD to do and they got back to me on was average ridership on the weekend compared to weekdays, because a lot of our numbers are based on weekdays. But on the weekend, it looks like there's about half, half the level of ridership. And there are a lot of social activities happening around the city for families uh, on, on weekends. So it, it seems like the idea of having a, a, the ability for people to to use this, especially people that are regular customers of RTD in a, in a family plan is, is that much more valuable. That's so all. I, think, I think we're all in agreement. I mean, that's why the family plan idea is in there is that it's a great concept. Administratively, it, it's difficult to implement that. So this is just su suggesting exploring that most of the family that you'd want to bring are going to be kids. And if kids are freer up to a higher age category, you can get a lot of that benefit without having to carry a or get a family pass. Um, anyway, it'd be simple. Yeah, it'd be much simpler because it just would be, they'd just be free. I'm okay with the including language around exploring. I mean, RTD is actively in their fair study. And I would assume that would be part of this conversation as well. Me too. Okay. okay. So, and D Daya, to your point earlier, um, would the language be um, um, RTD should explore increasing the age of youth receiving free fares or or passes to include middle schoolers or possibly even high schoolers? I So I was actually thinking increasing, I mean, given that their youth is currently to zero to five receive free fares and then six to 19 receive this 70% uh, discount. It's almost, I, I'm just kind of wondering like how do we actually capture the opportunity youth on the higher end of the spectrum, but. Right. So. Uh, I wonder if it's explore. Explore. Uh, maybe we just leave it broad, like eligible um, age brackets for to, or eligible age brackets for the youth fair, the youth fair and pass program. Um, I, I think that there's some administrative pieces that I don't have the information on what it would look like to implement. It would, they, it would seem to me that it would be simpler to administer when you're only getting 30% of the fare if there's a 70% discount for those kids to just increase the age of kids that ride for free. 
Now, I, I haven't crunched the numbers to know how that would impact RPD's total revenues, but I can't think that it would that it would have a huge impact on, on those revenues. And if it wouldn't, then all you have to do is say, okay, how old are you? Show me a school ID or whatever. And if you're if you're 19 or younger, then you, you're fine riding with your family. They don't, wouldn't even have to be a certain kind of a family pass then. It would just be an adult riding with the kids, which is already provided for, but only up to a fairly young age. So that would read sort of um, RTD should explore increasing the eligible youth age or the eligible age category for free fares. I'll leave that to Dana. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I, I just plugged into the chat. I mean, and we can we can we can stay up to high school in high school to be determined. All right. How do, are people okay with that? I apologize, you guys. I had to step away. Is it just free fare, or we should explore discounted or free fare? I'm sorry, guys. I, I missed that part of the discussion. I think we we're talking about pre fair for those, those, uh, the part of that family. Although I grew up in the South and some of the people in my high school had, had full beards. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I wouldn't want to limit it. Free or discounted would be my preference, but I'm not, it's not a hill I'm going to die on. And if everybody else is comfortable with just making it free, I think uh, right now it's discounted, but it's at a higher dis. So, our, our right simplification thing would bring down the existing discount that youth get. Correct. I understand right? And that. so to make up for that and to simplify things for, we don't need, we, we're not gonna contradict that by saying give youth a bigger discount because that basically is the status quo of complicated Correct. discounts. Correct. The way to fix that would be to increase the number of years youth could be free to make up for the fact that youth in general are losing some of their discount if we reduce it to a 50% across the board discount. And so I, I, I understand. I, I, okay. So I, as long as we say explore, I'm good with it. Sorry. Thank you guys for indulging me. Okay. So right now it's RTD should explore increasing the eligible um, age category for free fares up to middle school or even high school aged youth. Yeah. Does that work? Anybody have an issue? Okay. Is that the last one or is there another one? Last one. That's the last one. That's Yay. the last one. Yeah. Okay. So do we want to... Can I just say impressive? That was quick. That was much yeah. faster than I would have thought you could do that. <laughs> Yay. Whoever, I've got a hand up here. <laughs> right. You know, I, I wrote at the end of the last meeting or just before the last meeting about a concern in uh, how the survey was described. You always have a one liner or two liner at the top that summarizes the survey and then you get into all the details of the survey. and. I, I have to say that I was really impressed by how positive the community response was on, on, uh, on this, uh, on all of our recommendations. The lowest response that we got on the recommendation on any little minor recommendation was 66% and a good many of them were in the 80s. And so I think it reflects the fact that we, we did a fairly good job of listening to the community and that and that our recommendations are reasonable and rational recommendations for the most part. <laughs> and, that, and that one of the things that, uh, that we ought to do is we ought to, not, uh, we ought to not be shy about saying how, strong, how strongly they were recommended. And so as someone pointed out at 1.40 this morning, I sent an email out with a uh, a list of suggested changes of uh, how we word these top line discussions. Uh, and just to give you a couple of examples of that, uh, governance, we said the majority 
nearly 73% of respondents agreed with recommendations to create sub-regional service councils. I recommend that the language be almost three quarters, 73% of respondents agreed with the recommendation to create those. Uh, it puts a lot more meaning behind what that 73% means. And, uh, and similarly, operations, uh, most respondents said they strongly agree with the idea of simplifying fares and past programs. Several respondents wrote comments opposing per employee transportation fees. And instead operations over eight in 10, 84% of respondents said they agreed with the idea of simplifying fares and past programs with over half, 57% strongly agreeing. However, several respondents wrote comments opposing the per employee transportation fees. My, my only point in this is that, is that we've got a very strong case that com the community strongly endorses this. And I think those, it's very important when your first appendix is your survey, that those opening comments on the results of each one of those questions be as positive as, as is legitimately fair for it to be given the numbers that we got. And the numbers we got from our community survey, which is, is not a true hard statistical survey, but the response we got was very strongly positive to our recommendations. And I just like to see how we wrote those strengthened some. And I said, everyone on this call got a copy of this memo, although I admit it came in rather er late early. Uh, today. And it just goes through these different ones and makes suggestions of how that lang language can better support uh, the case, particularly with the governor's office and with uh, the uh, legislature and also with RTD, who are all going to be looking at this, at this survey. So, so this is on related to Appendix 1. And then if you look at Appendix 1, almost all of these, there's this introductory highlighted sentence that, that basically summarizes the result of that question. And I think saying majority when you got 73% is not. What so what should. are you, what are you editing since I, there wasn't. Yeah, everywhere you, everywhere I look, I never had a chance to edit it in place because the whole survey wasn't in the distributed uh, pieces. They all said placeholder to be completed by Dr. Cog's staff. So what this is, would be a recommendation to Dr. Cog to use this, this uh, more positive language about uh, the results of these. Now, there may be reasons why they chose not to use more positive language. And if there why is- don't we, Why don't we ask Dr. Cog's staff if there is any reason that they didn't present them in, <clears throat> in the more positive manner that you suggest and see if there's a, a, a response on that or an objection to using a stronger. Right. Madam Chair, Matthew, if it, is Lisa if it, here? Uh, I believe, I don't believe Lisa is on the meeting. Uh, if, if it's the committee's preference to use uh, that type of language that, that Rut just summarized, uh, staff would be happy to include it in the report. I don't think there's any reason why wouldn't use that type of language. Does anyone else have any thoughts from Dr. Cogstaff or um, North Highland? This is Ron. I don't, I don't have any objection to the edits. All right, this is Doug. I would just add, I don't have any problem either. I think it, it, you know, the responses were overwhelmingly supportive relative to other, most other polls. So I, I don't know if staff were trying to look for distinguishing um, characteristics between really like and really, really, really like. Um, 
but I think as long as it, the intro includes the, the wording that this is not a statistically significant survey, it's Which an online true. survey that gives us a sort of qualitative sentiment, um, then I think it's fine to say how glowing that was. And I believe um, we'd already talked about the importance of clarifying that, that it's not a statistically valid survey. So I'm fine with Rutt's suggestions. And I'd also point out, I did leave some negatives in here that were in the original material. For example, um, on Northwest Rail, I said nearly three quarters, 72% of respondents agreed with the idea of focusing on bus rapid transit until adequate funding is identified for Northwest Rail with 42% strongly agreeing. However, 15% opposed <clears throat> this recommendation, which is not an overwhelming number, but it's certainly more than we saw in some of the others. You knew there were going to be some people that were not going to like this, that recommendation. So, Rut, let me just stop you and see if anybody on the committee has an issue with including the language that Rut sent out in the email this morning in describing the survey results. I'm not seeing any no's. Um, and Dan um, agreed with me about making sure that the introduction also includes the language about this not being a statistically valid survey. I agree with that too. Okay, I think we might have resolution on that then. So let it be so. So this is really a direction to staff because we won't be able to edit the language because it's not in there yet um, to make sure to include Rutt's proposed language and the clarification that it's not a statistically valid survey. And with that, it. are there any outstanding sort of big picture discussion items or can we go through the, the final report and just see if there's any problems with any of the line edits that anybody made? Okay, and uh, so what we'll do is we'll slowly scroll through. And if you have issues with what you see redlined, you need to speak up and I won't be able to necessarily see your hand. So just take your, unmute yourself and holler out. So we had the air pollution addition um, and a greater explanation of the other woes RTD was facing that led to the committee's creation. Why don't you keep scrolling? We also added a, uh, a sentence around COVID. Uh, one, one question on that um, introduction is, there's no mention of RTD helping to reduce automobile congestion. Is that, it talks about air quality and climate, et cetera, but. When, Matthew, can you scroll back up? Uh, RTD helps reduce transportation related climate emissions and air pollution. Uh, so important to the quality environment along the front range and provides an equitable mobility alternative for people who cannot. Who yeah, cannot we can see that. What do, you, what do you want to add? Transportation uh, congestion? Well, I, I guess, yeah, does it reduce, is it intended to reduce automobile congestion too? I mean, that, I would think that would be one of its primary uh, objectives. I don't have a problem with calling that out since it, and it's all certainly all related. I would think you'd want to add that right after the words reduce, helps reduce traffic congestion, or what did you say? Is that? Yes. Traffic congestion, comma. And transportation related climate emissions and air pollution. Climate emissions and air pollution. Yeah. All right. Any problems with adding traffic ingestion after reduce? All right. Let's keep moving.
So as somebody holler for going too fast, that this is just a typo. Keep going. All right, stop. I think you want whatever that big paragraph is. I don't know how easy. Yeah. So this is just where we add we, where we added the and implementation timeline after response in the third sentence of that new paragraph. Does that sound familiar to everybody? Yep. So, okay, let's keep going. Keep going. I think we approved the meeting structure edits the last meeting. So I think we can keep going. Those were largely sort of typos and, and readability there. Why don't you stop at the equity assessments? I think I added this language. I thought equity was such an important point for this committee and that the intro that was used um, in our interim report was stronger and cl clearer than, than the initial version of this. So I suggested we cut and paste it in. That's where that came from. Don't see any issues, so I guess keep going. These edits were just to not go into the weeds about com committee consideration of 12, uh, 21, oh. Um, HB 2186. Yeah, that's, a, that's the wrong bill number. Is it? Matthew, can you make note of that? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch that. We will correct the bill number. Okay, and I don't know if the link is therefore also in need of correction or not. Okay. We will check. Thanks. And then when you're ready, I guess you can keep scrolling. Um, I just clarified that paragraph on this, the transportation funding bill to sort of more accurately describe our role in commenting on it and what the ultimate conclusion was, was that the bill passed and it included more multimodal funding. Yeah. Any issues with that? I don't see anybody. Okay. So on the, the stimulus funds, um, we suggested adding a sort of overarching paragraph about the, 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 how big the overall pot was in our role in reviewing CARES Act and making recommendations for all of them. Does that work for people? Mm -hmm. Not seeing any objections, so I guess keep going. All right, stop there. Um, I made the, that um, edit to clarify what a recommendation was. It wasn't just to spend money um, because obviously RTD is gonna spend the money, but to clarify that we wanted to spend it on ridership and improving operations. And then it adds a little bit more uh, context as well as um, the point that we discussed at the last meeting of saying this is really we believe that this money needs to be spent quickly to re to uh, rebuild ridership before people now that people are returning to work before they start uh, commuting again by vehicle the single occupancy vehicle before they start developing bad habits yep okay all right well, is everybody comfortable with our process I, I don't want to move us too fast, but I'm, a, I'm trusting you all or finding your voices if you see anything that you don't like. I've read this thing so many times, my eyes are bleeding. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you, Rhett. Uh. <laughs>
I don't know if I could see a mistake in it at this point. Well, or anything that gives you pause. Yeah. Keep going. So why don't you just pause there and just, I wanna make sure everybody was fine with, we talked about surface councils and membership last time and, and just made a couple of minor tweaks. There wasn't a whole lot of, there weren't any other comments added since then. So the feeling is that those tweaks captured the general gist of our conversation last time and no further edits were needed, just making sure that that's the case. If anybody needs further discussion of that, speak up now. Okay, let's keep going then. Oh, I just saw one that I was a change I made that got unchanged. Okay. And and down here, it says, just below this, above it says the table talks about the four unfinished corridors. And then below this, it says the five unfinished fast tracks corridors. There are actually four corridors. Within one of those corridors, Northwest Rail uh, Corridor, there are two different proposals, but there are only four corridors. And so, I believe that under recommendations, explore fast tracks options, it should say the four unfinished fast tracks corridors. We can make the change, Ron. Okay, thanks. See, you are still seeing mistakes. Nice job. Mm. Okay, why don't you keep scrolling then? Maybe stop for a second here. This was the change that was discussed last meeting that the mayors and commissioners coalition from the Northwest had asked for um, that it, it shifts the one paragraph from four to five and basically references the appendix six rather than going into the, the detail that's below what we have on our screen. Um, I know that we've heard uh, recommendations back and forth and just want to make sure is there comfort where, where we've landed with this and Rhett, let me just give you a moment to see how you're feeling about terrible. I, I, I just am destroyed that my verbiage was altered in any way. <laughs> no, it's better now than it was before. And I appreciate especially your role in in working with with these uh, these other groups like that all important commission coalition. So no, this is this is uh, this is good. Okay. Anybody else have any pause or concern? Okay. Why don't you keep scrolling then? You'll see the rest of that recommendation of putting that that extra detail in the appendix. Mm -hmm. We're flying now. We are. Madam Chair, I will have a question on fares. Okay, let's stop here. And, and this is the great place to stop. No, back where you were, right there, that last bullet, Eliminate exact change requirements for discounted fares. I, I'm wondering what that means and what the intent of that is. Uh, is the driver supposed to make change if they don't have the exact fare for the discounted fare? 
I just I'm not clear what that what that means and what that's intended to do. Sure, I'm going to ask Daya to respond, and I'll note the red line there was just to put the most important recommendation first, which was the the consolidating fares under 50% discount. But Daya, do you want to respond about the exact change piece? Yeah, so this was um, part, I think, of one of the recommendations or some feedback that we had gotten from folks in Boulder, but then some of the other institutions that we had talked to during the um, during the course of the committee. My understanding was that if you if you currently use the youth or the low income fare, you have to have the exact change to be able to take advantage of that while you're while you're on the bus. I don't believe that they give change out, which essentially means that RTD is kind of keeping that, um, I guess that, that revenue or the funding that goes in. Um, that was my understanding. I could be mistaken, but that was some of the feedback that we had gotten from folks, folks like I said, in Boulder and in other communities as well. I'm curious if that's an issue, a COVID issue, handling cash that, that's part of why that was done. There's so that existed pre-COVID. Pardon? My that existed pre-COVID. The exact change. Making change can be dangerous. I, I just don't think that RTD drivers are going to be able to make change. So the question is if somebody has less than the discounted fare and they're paying by cash, whether they just take it or um, it's just a little confusing to me, and I think some clarity there might help. I, I don't know what the intent was. Hey, team, it's Chris. I'm going to have to go. I hate to do that, but unfortunately, it's just the way the schedule worked out. Chris, thank you so um, much for your service. Yeah, amazing work. Look forward to seeing the final draft. It's been an incredible experience. So thank you. Um, talk to you soon. OK. So, uh, Daya, what would make sense? Do we want uh, anybody from RTD who might be on the line to provide any clarity yeah. of understanding? Or I think if we do have someone from RTD, I would open it up to General Manager Johnson or a member of RTD staff to just give a little bit more clarity so we can determine a path on this. Is it basically to accept less than exact change for discounted fares? Mm -hmm. I've, I've certainly been on the bus plenty of times where somebody assumes that they can get changed back and they show up with a $20 bill and are SOL. Um, mm -hmm. And I can see wanting to eliminate that situation, particularly for um, impacted groups that are using discounted fares in particular. But I don't know, is, is there a member of the RTD staff that could provide clarity on the current, the status quo situation with uh, exact change requirements? So this is Deborah Johnson. So if I understand you're seeking clarity on whether or not exact change is a necessity when boarding our vehicles. Yeah. If you are using the discounted fare. If you're using a discounted fare, you would still have to have exact change. Our fare boxes don't accommodate making change and we don't accept credit cards with current fare box in which we have. There's newer ones that do, but our current fare box system does not allow to make change. Thanks for that explanation. So this is really then, as I understand the recommendation would say for this discounted fare category. But, uh, Elise, it, it, that means they don't make change for anybody, right? It's true. So I, I am not comfortable with them. I guess I don't want to change it. If that's their policy, they don't make change. I don't think a recommendation from us saying you should make change for discounted fares makes good sense. I guess I, I would question that. But thank you. Yeah, I guess I'd be willing to let go of this recommendation. I think that implementation of it is going to be a little bit fraught. And, um, but again, Daya, if, 
if you feel strongly, I'm happy to hear. Yeah, I mean, I'm willing to, to let go. I mean, I just acknowledge right now the fare is an even $3. So if I'm paying to get on the bus, there's not the need to miss it. There's not a need for me to get change if I can, unless I pay with a $5 bill. But I'm also willing to. Okay. So other folks, should we just remove this bullet entirely? I almost hate to say anything, but but if, if the fare is 75 cents and I put a dollar in, does that mean I don't get to ride the bus even if I don't want change back? You, know, you get to ride, you just don't get to to get on the bus and get where I'm going. Yeah, no, that's not an issue. You can always overpay. Yeah, you can always overpay. You just don't get any of your money back. If you had a $20 bill for a 75 cent fare, you're paying 20 bucks. <laughs> I so, wish we had a 75 cent fare. <laughs> right. I could pay for all my friends too. Yeah. Okay, just trying to move us along. Yeah. What are people's, I think the current proposal on the table is to remove this bullet. Yep, I'm in favor of that. Does anybody oppose removing this bullet? It's okay with Daya, it's okay with me. Okay. Okay, then, and, but before you leave then, I just wanna flag that um, this is where we're adding RTD should explore increasing the eligible age category for free fares up to middle school or even high school aged youth. For our prior discussion. Okay, you can keep going. This is fun. We're flying here. Well, that said, I, I would encourage uh, Daya or uh, Matthew to stop us anywhere in this process where they think there's something of particular. Yeah, Matthew is just, Matthew scrolling through pages where there are no changes at all. Yeah, I think he's- I think the next, the next page with any change is page 54, Matthew. What? Um... We, we did hear from a stakeholders on page uh, about a, a comment on uh, page 39 right here that I'd like to bring quick, briefly to the attention of the, of the committee. Uh, we, we made a presentation to Dr. Cog's Area Agency on Aging um, Transportation Subcommittee uh, last week. And they questioned this uh, letter A here about uh, the uh, demographics of the most Im impacted areas, and it said not applicable, and uh, they they were just uh, they just questioned it. They didn't uh, un understand why it wasn't applicable, so just wanted to bring that to the committee's attention and today's attention. Yeah, and I can just jump in on some of the equity assessments. It was a little challenging because again, we're talking about the region, so this could be changed. The demographics are the region itself. The way the equity screen was developed is. It was it was difficult to break down the specific demographics. Hmm. I think the I think the point of this one was that there are kind of the assessment was that the entire region is affected. There's not sort of a geographic area that's more particularly more impacted than another geographic area. Is that perhaps a better way to put it than, to, mm -hmm. than just to say not applicable? I agree with that. So could we could we request that that change be made? We will adjust the language. Good. Okay.
So here, I just encouraged us to explain where the appendices were from. So for, I think, five and six, just clarifying that those were developed by the finance subcommittee. That's what that change was. Yeah, I choked on that a little bit first, but in the end, I'm okay. We I almost said by well, rut, but I, I broadened it slightly. The most important thing is that these are recommendations by all of us in the committee. And if all of us in the committee don't agree, we ought to vote against them. So um, it, it I, I, I agree. I just said the analysis was done by the subcommittee. Okay. Yeah. The recommendations, which are above, are, are we're all we all need to endorse. Well, one other comment. I do hope there's somebody that's going through and checking all these links to make sure they go where they're supposed to go. If any of this stuff in, from the finance committee, the links don't work, please let me know and I'll, I'll get that solved. What? Woohoo! Could it be? <laughs> so I, I, I just want to pause here and see: it, is there anything on anybody's mind that we did not discuss today that you wanted to, thought we should? Big issue, little issue. You know, the at least only thing I'll add is I think I brought up last meeting of being interested in moving the, the CRISA stimulus dollars funding from its own category to sort of being in with budget. But I think I think the flow is okay. And what's most important is the language in there. So I'm okay with where it's at. Okay. Thanks for that comment. Anything else? Wow. All right. Um, I'm just going to briefly summarize the changes that we made today. And then we'll be ready, I believe, for a motion to adopt. So just real quickly, and I'm saying this for staff and all of us, um, we're adding um, uh, implementation timeline with the process for the process for RTD's review. We're adding a sentence around there may be a surplus from CRISA funds at year's end that we'd like to see accountability on those funds. We're removing the, the, the um, CRISA and adding where appropriate in that same area. We're changing the metric, performance metric from percent increase in fair revenue to percent change in fair revenue. We're adding that RTD should explore increasing the eligible age category for free fares up to middle school or even high school aged youth. We're adding in the appendix one, the more positive language that Rutt suggested in his email this morning to describing the survey, along with the clarification that it's not a statistically valid survey. We added the words traffic congestion to the intro paragraph, talking about RTD's role. We are going to fix the bill number referenced to 1286 and the uh, four, not five fast tracks, unfinished, court, unfinished fast tracks corridors. 
We're eliminating the recommendation around exact change. And we're uh, clarifying uh, on page nine, 39 of the equity assessment that um, it's not applicable because it affects the entire region. So the, those are, I believe, all of the changes that we discussed making to this draft document um, as presented in red line form. And it is amazing and you could remember all of those things. Well, I wrote them down as we talked about them. <laughs> so if that is indeed uh, the complete body of work we did this morning, and I think it is, I would accept a motion to adopt these as our final recommendations as amended. Madam Chair, I would like to make a recommendation that we adopt the RTD Accountability Committee final report with the changes that you described. So we have a motion to adopt. Do we have a second? second. I'll second. I'll third. <laughs> All right. Any final comments on these recommendations before we move to a vote? Okay, all in favor, please raise your hand and holler aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It is unanimous. Woohoo! Um, could I just take a moment, and I'm sure my co-chair would like to do the same, and thank everybody for the incredible, incredible amount of effort and expertise, insight, uh, energy that you brought to this process. I don't think any of us had any idea what we were signing up for when we um, <laughs> agreed to serve on this committee, but I, I am so proud of the work we've done, the hours we put in. Everybody dove deep. Some of you... Uh, you know, the subcommittee chairs did some really heavy lifting, um, going above and beyond, uh, devoting appendices um, to this work. And all of us put in so many hours every month for a year. Um, and I'm really proud of the work that we came up with. I think this is a solid body of uh, analysis and recommendations. And I very sincerely hope that RTD um, implements all of our great suggestions. Um, <laughs> So I just want to say thank you. And I also thank you to Dr. Cog's staff. I think you probably also didn't know what you were agreeing to. And we could not have <laughs> done this without you. Um, that the incredible amount of work in, in North Highland for your uh, consulting work as well. Um, really, really, really appreciate that. I'm sure I forgot somebody in the thank yous. Oh, and RTD for playing ball and showing up. I don't think I anticipated that um, General Manager Johnson would show up to every single committee and subcommittee meeting and participate. And that really speaks volumes to how seriously you're taking this, this process and engaging. And, and we really, really do appreciate that as well. And, and also Lynn and Troy, who actually yes. were the ex officios, who made such a difference in, in connecting us with the right people when we were steering off in the wrong direction. <laughs> and educating us. Yes, grounding us in reality. Crystal, did you want to say anything? I Oh, of course. I, I think you covered, I think, uh, the sentiments um, that hopefully we all share. Just thank you to Dr. Cog's staff. You guys were phenomenal to work with, very professional, very expedient, and just really a pleasure to be able to work with you all. Um, to the full committee, thank you all for your dedication. I agree, our subcommittee chairs um, going above and beyond um, what I think uh, would have been a reasonable expectation of, of work and commitment. And um, as co-chair, uh, I know we benefited greatly being able to tag team and, um, you know, create different leadership opportunities um, and input for through, through that subcommittee chair structure. So I'm really glad that we move forward with that. And it's been a pleasure to work with you all um, to RTD, RTD staff, um, General Manager Johnson, I you know you kind of walked into this uh, <laughs> situation and I think we all empathized with what that um, my position looked like and, um, you know, steadfast in our pursuit uh, in, in conversation and co uh, collaboration and exploration. And 
At times, I don't think we all fully agreed in how we might approach a certain topic, but I hope that we've been able to resolve it to a point where RTD can kind of take it and run. And I am looking forward to, though this is our last committee meeting, I'm looking forward to the responses um, from RTD because, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we were all here, we had a position, but we all have a vested interest in the success of um, of this system. Uh, I can speak for myself as a council member and, and how that impacts, how those impacts are felt on a local level, representing my constituents, um, my shared passion for sustainability and access, I mean, just permeates all of these um, conversations. So I'm looking forward to that. And um, hopefully this is the start of something really positive. Um, I don't know if we'll ever reconvene again, because geez, that was a long <laughs> process, uh, intensive process, but um, at least at a minimum, we'll be able to follow some of the recommendations that we felt so strongly about in this committee. So again, thank you all so, so much. And thank you to the public for tuning in. And um, I know we didn't have as much public input during the meetings as we had hoped. Um, I did see that we often had uh, several attendees outside of this committee. We had emails, phone calls, um, surveys um, to sort of uh, to make up for that um, potential loss of participation. So just thanks all again. And um, Elise, did you want to give everyone else an opportunity to chime in? I know it could get long, but it's the last one and it might be nice. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy. I think we can open the mic to, to uh, committee members and um, anybody who wants to speak. We got, you know, closure is important. We do have one more final meeting with RTD, but um, Julie and then Kristen. Yeah, I think you guys covered everybody so far. And I, I do want to just do a quick shout out to Dr. Cogstaff and for taking all of those additional calls <laughs> and um, dealing with all those additional thoughts that we've been throwing your way. Um, I know it's been an extra, you know, huge task for you guys to complete. Another um, air group of folks I just wanted to, to highlight again was really a lot of city staff followed our conversations closely. They engaged in our, um, when we had subgroups um, conversations, especially for the governance of committee, they showed up, they asked questions, they gave their opinion, um, either in those forums or they reached out to us via email with their thoughts and ideas. And I just want to give a huge shout out to all of the city staff from the various communities that tuned in were engaged and, and really just followed us along with this process. It was, your your input was really um, valuable and it helped a lot. So thank you so much. Kristen? Now that we have come to the end of this incredible process, all I have to say is the angels are singing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I hope those devils keep quiet. Well, the, yes, but the devil every, spoke a lot. The, yes, <laughs> yes, I, I understand that too. You are no <laughs> devil, Mayor. <laughs> Just as we as we come to this end of of this incredible process, it is finally a uh, a whoop whoop situation. I, I, I say, just. Oh. It, I just want to say I would love to get together face to face at some point, share a beverage. Right. It's it's been I feel like I've gotten to know you all and respect you all and really value um, the camaraderie and the expertise. But it's weird that we haven't sat face to face. <laughs> Jackie. I, I, no, I was going to say the same thing, Elise. I think we all need to meet at Union Station, take RTD in whatever capacity you can. And I know I know, Dan, you know, some some folks that are not as close to us, but uh, we, we can put you virtually there on the table in FaceTime. But I, I really have to say how much um, I have enjoyed getting to know e virtually each and every single one of you that I had not had the pleasure of meeting before. And I really do think this was a really tremendous opportunity for me. And so I want to thank you to everybody for the great participation. And, and that includes the, the all encompassing uh, team from RTD, team from Dr. Cog. Uh, our respective staffs that engage, but but really my fellow committee members and and the folks that held leadership positions and as subcommittee chairs and and co-chairing this, I I really uh, want to just say a huge thank you and really what a pleasure it really was to serve on this and I I didn't know what to expect 
given the virtual world, and I don't think we could have gotten a better outcome. So thank you to everyone for your engagement and participation. And, and I really do want to all meet at Union Station. So we got to figure that out. I'm going to leave that to the esteemed co-chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> if, and if, I, it if I could just say that, that uh, when you look at how the committees operated, the one thing that I appreciated more than anything else was the fact that our co-chairs and our, our uh, committee sub-chairs were often in all of the different meetings or as many as they could rationally be able to sit in on and really contributed a lot. And, and, you know, there were a number of these issues that weren't issues for just one subcommittee. And I was really proud that we were effective in working together and, and sharing ideas and, and being able to, to bring that, all of that knowledge uh, to this final process. And, and I just can't thank all of my fellow committee members and, and especially Dr. Cog, who kept this rational from time to time, along with, with certainly Lynn and Troy and, and Deborah and, and so many others. It, it's really been a pleasure getting to know you, uh, getting to know you better. And I don't want, I'll buy the first round. <laughs> Ooh. I, yeah. I see Lynn wanted to say something. Just briefly, I've got worker noise behind me, but thank you all for your, your commitment and dedication to RTD and uh, public transit. I think we all share it and uh, um, I appreciate working together with you. Thanks. Troy? Well, I have been the probably the most silent and, and appropriately so during this whole process, but uh, I just appreciate the respect shown to uh, Lynn and Deborah and I and staff from especially from the co-chairs and the subcommittee chairs um, i gotta tell you you're a very impressive conscientious bunch of uh, community servants and uh, I'm, I'm moved every time i see how you weigh in and the homework you do and the support you have from your staffs if you're from the city or the state and uh, been very impressed each and every meeting so uh, uh, congratulations on your good work and uh, well done Thanks, Troy. Doug? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I also, I just, I want real quick on behalf of Dr. Cox, thank you. I'm so proud of the diligence of this committee. I, you know, when Matthew, Ron, and I were talking about, you know, the uh, this concept of having seven meetings a month, right, through the various subcommittees. And like, I was like, oh my God, they're going to kill us. I mean, there's no way that this is ever going to fly. And uh, not not even a whimper from, from the committee. I think you guys understood you know, some of the time sensitive nature of this and, you know, the, the, you know, just the complexity of the issues that you guys were going to have the conversation about. So I want to thank you very much for, I never got any, any hateful phone calls. Like we got to, <laughs> we got to get going, but, uh, but I think we ultimately got to a very good product and I'm so appreciative. I'm so glad Julie mentioned the local government staff, um, all those side conversations that we had with them to, to get to where we are today, I think was very, was fabulous. And RTD staff too. And in particular, Deborah, and as, as someone mentioned, her to attend all these meetings was, was fabulous. And I think it means something to the, to the entire group. So thank you, Deborah. Okay, now I feel compelled. Um, but I too want to, you know, basically express my gratitude and thanks. Yes, I did come in the midst of all of this and I thought it was very important to me, recognize the dubious task that I have leading this organization. I needed to understand, you know, what was transpiring and support my staff and support all of you. And I want to commend you all for your steadfast work, your openness to hear our perspectives going forward. And I'd be remiss not to acknowledge Dr. Cox's staff in reference to working with my staff as we were trying to navigate, you know, who's who in the zoo and what should be happening. So I wanna thank you all very much for your leadership and your dedication for the betterment of all the constituents in which we serve here. So I appreciate your hard work and look forward to um, basically expanding our relationship because we're partners in all of this. So thank you very much for your time. All right. Any going, going, gone? We've got four minutes till, oh, I see Dan's hand up. Well, I hope I'm not the last person <laughs> uh, to speak today, but as an outsider, I really wanted to thank uh, this group for uh, all of his hard work and, and the leadership. Uh, it's, it's been impressive for me to be able to participate in this process. And 
And I know there were times when I was trying to make a comment, people probably went, what's Dan going to say now? And uh, I have to confess some of the times I was wondering that myself, but uh, you are just an amazing group of folks. Um, and and I, I'm so proud of the work that you've done and for my small contribution, if any, to this process. Uh, and what came through to me was really the pride that this group has in RTD and their care and concern for it and their desire to make it a better organization in the future. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you. I hope I do have an opportunity to uh, meet you personally at some point in the future. Uh, I have to pick my 18-year-old son up at the airport in a couple of weeks, and I took him down last night and dropped him off at La Quinta out there on Tower Boulevard, and I had to catch a plane at uh, 6 o'clock this morning, Then I drove back so I could be here for this meeting. Uh, so uh, maybe next Monday, if you want to do that, I'd be able to participate. But otherwise, uh, I hope that I have uh, some contact with you all in the future. Again, thank you for allowing me to be a uh, participant. Thanks, Dan. All right. Are we ready to wrap this up? All right. Thanks again to everyone. Maybe we'll do a doodle poll about getting together in person and then there will be that one last meeting with RTD in 45 days or so. But um, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you around. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>